what what do you think about all this concept that's happening at the moment with you know uh, fans shooting the band, uh -huh. fans interviewing the band, fans shooting us? I yeah. was never a big fan of being shot, uh, but with video cameras, it's okay. You know, you get you get professionals out there that they're a little jaded with all the hey, I want to put my mark on this with this, and this is my style, and this is that. And Why not show them? Well, anybody, really, if you've been doing it long enough, you, you develop a style. Signature. And it's kind of hard to break out of that. So it's kind of cool having the fans uh, shoot it from, you know, they're basically shooting what they want to see. So it makes total sense. One thing that people seem to be curious about are your tats. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just wondering whether you had any that you could maybe briefly show or whatever and sort of give a bit of a story about what it sort of means to you, you know, yeah, personally. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, these guys here, first of all, I mean, went through my time of uh, kind of infatuated with angels and just the the next afterlife or something. And, you know, my parents kind of leaving this earth earlier than others, having some kind of guide in my life because I know I, I, I should have died hundreds of times and I'm, I know I'm not the only one but I can only speak for myself that I know there are things like after I've done something like wow that was really stupid I could have it's like man my my mom or dad or somebody is it made it. made that car turn this way instead or something and it's it's kind of nice to see those those or realize those things uh, this is my higher power this is an angel bringing the gift of music to me. These are actually my hands. The, uh, the tattoo artist, Jack Rudy, he, uh, he took a Polaroid of my hands and then he copied them. So that's me in struggle. And this is the angel bringing me music to help me through the fire. And this uh, in Latin is uh, donum die, which means gift from God. So this one is you know, besides my kids' names yeah. and all of the other, I mean, they've obviously all got meanings, but this one is pretty important. And then Cliff, you know, this is Clifford Lee Burton, and this is uh, the middle bit to Orion, the bass part. Awesome. Do -de -do -de -do -de -do -do. Oh, man. No, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Like, most people find it hard enough to stop drinking, like, you know, when stresses in their life are around. I know I've you know, I battle even, you know, I hit the bottle way too often. And someone like yourself who um, has the public eye on you, you know, you're always being scrutinized by people unfairly, whatever. Like, what sort of kept you going to be able to, you know, to do what you, to do what you did? Because that, that can't be an easy thing. It is, it is tough and, and learning certain tools is important to be out on the road, especially, uh, um, well, you know, nowadays, there's a lot more bands out there that the bottle's not that important to them, or the drug, or the smoke, or the whatever, the chicks, you know, whatever it is that kind of sidetrack you. A lot of, it's not as important as it seems as it used to be. Um, but yeah, it can be a challenge, you know, when the stuff's there, it's sitting right in front of you, you know. And um, for me, it's, it, I'm not really haven't been really good at long-term goals <laughs> you know and long-term happiness is was always pretty foreign to me i'm going to be happy right now <laughs> i want it now because i feel like shit. and you know the drink the chick the whatever was always a quick quick fix do you miss it well if i want to if i want to miss it if i you know if, if i if I feed the dog that says, this was so great, remember this? Uh, or if I feed the dog that says, dude, look how great your life is right now. Look at the crap that you used to be in. You know, there's, it depends on how you look at it. And I know I could, I, could, I could go back and fuck things up pretty quick, pretty quick, and I don't, I don't need to do that. Um, so, but also, you know, when, you know, the criticizing, the, the public guy, the things like that, it really depends on my mood. If I'm in a really good mood, I can, I can take anything at any time. But if I'm feeling a little insecure or a little tired or a little hungry or whatever it is, or just 
little, you know, frayed from the road. And that's why we don't go out for such long periods of time, because you do, you start to get frayed and your head starts to swell. You think you're greater than you are and all of this stuff. And, you know, uh, I could do whatever I want. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm doing stuff I don't need to be doing. So keeping, keeping the tour legs shorter has helped a lot. And then all the criticism, you know, it's just, people are people, man, you know? We're no greater than each other. We got the same size soul and we're trying to, we're trying to feel happy and we're trying to feel loved. That's simple as that. And some people think if they can put someone else down, they feel a little more, their ego comforts them a little bit. And I know what that's like, man. So I, I, I contributed to that. It's like, oh, they're just being like that now, you know? It's got nothing to do with me. So being able to, to kind of let it bounce off you uh, is sometimes difficult, but that's the tool I like to use. What is it that sort of prevents you from sort of straying away from, you know, Metallica? Yeah, there, there, there are two sides to me on that. The one side is, I am so happy here. Uh, I get to write whatever I want. Uh, I mean, dude, I just wrote an intro to my apocalypse last week and we played it at the concert the other night it's like whoa this is awesome there's a lot of freedom if you let it you know but there's a lot of times when we all kind of get hung up on each other and hey you want to try this it's like whoa maybe no uh, you know this the democracy is like ah. and you know i gotta step back and think it's like you know what well maybe that's best that's best for us if we're not all in agreement with it, let's not do it, man, you know? Or management thinks, well, this is maybe a bad idea. It's like, eh, we're gonna fight him a little bit on it. And then it's like, well, wherever the passion is, I, I'll believe you, I'll believe you on that. The true passion is the key. And th that is that we go with that. And so obviously you get enough of that in the band to be able to sort of sustain you without needing to look for that elsewhere. Well, I think I keep trying to do stuff outside of it, you know, even, you know, like writing Nothing Else Matters. That was not Metallica. That was not going to be for Metallica. That was just me and my head and my, you know, misery for a while. And they heard it and said, hey, bring it on in. So it seems like anything is able to be Metallica, you know, which is fine. Um, but then there's the other side of me that's like, well, you know, they're keeping, you know, uh, management doesn't want me to do this because it's affecting the name of the band, so I can't do what I want here. And, blah, blah, blah. and it gets, you know, it gets, it gets single-minded. And that's, that's not, and I know that's not the right thing to do, you know. We got a great thing going here, and there's this, this part of me that thinks, you know, as soon as somebody goes off and does a side project, I don't, I don't take them as seriously anymore, and not, not to knock other bands, but say a you know a Slipknot, Corey, amazing frontman, amazing singer, but you don't really know which band he's in at the moment. You know he's got so many things going on, and if that's you know, and I can't, I certainly won't judge him on that if he if it's. Maybe it's maybe he's doing that to survive. Maybe the money thing is tough, or who knows what it is. But maybe he's not getting in all the stuff that he needs to get in. Uh, but that's his that's his journey. I don't. I I I, I would much rather. I think. I think. Um, I think dedication and loyalty it goes a long way with me. What album to you, like when you were a young kid, was one of those albums that sort of said, "This is." This is my calling, man. You know, like, what the hell is this? I've got to get more of it. Right. It had to be the Black Sabbath. You know, when uh, out of all the records in my brother's record collection, uh, my, my, my brother's 10 years older than I, he was in a band, and he had all kinds of uh, albums. And, you know, from Jethro Tull to the Beatles to whatever, all this other stuff, and... I put on Black Sabbath. That was that was pretty much it. Like Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath. Yeah, the self-titled. Yeah, yeah. The first album, yeah. put it on, and it was wow. This is different. 
And I like this. You know, this has got some, ooh, it's got some balls, it's got some heaviness, it's got, you know, a little bit of scariness in there, but it's it's next level, you know? It's, it's taking it a step further. Uh, this is just not regular bouncy rock. This is, this Eyes is, has, wide open. well, yeah, this has, uh, this has emotion behind it. This has, uh, power. you know, power, fear, whatever. You know, it, it really has to do with, your roots, man. When you're growing up, that stuff's so important and it's so impressionable on you. So everyone has that in their life. Uh, and whatever band it is at that time, you know, for my wife, it's, you know, Phil Collins, you know, <laughs> that's okay. It moves her. That shit reminds her of stuff of her teen years or something that she connects with and goes, wow. Uh, I can ground myself in this music. For me, going back, listening to Sabbath, listening to Skinner, listening to UFO, uh, listening to Priest, listening to Early Maiden, stuff like that, it does that, it does that for me. What's your proudest track that you know, you've written personally, yourself? That's a difficult question because I think we've all, we've all accomplished some great things uh, with different feels. Um, there are some songs that we kind of forget about that I think are pretty amazing. I, I think Bleeding Me is one of those moments. I think Outlaw Torn. I think Fixer. <laughs> you know, a, a little bit of those epic -y, you know, with it's kind of instrumentals with lyrics, really. Um, there's, uh, I'd say, the, the third verse in Unforgiven 2. There's a, just a, when it when it breaks down and there's that wow 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 you know the little wah you know I'm playing this part and, and Bob Rock's doing the wah and it's like wow we're professional now you know it sounds you know it's like it's almost Jimmy Page you know so we're we were entering the realm of Zeppelin at that point and uh, pretty proud of that too. What fears you the most about going on stage? Like is there something which you know, there's a thing at the back of your head that you sort of say, oh, you a know, lot of yeah. stuff I used to be afraid of on the stage. But I think obviously fire, but you know, <laughs> <after that. laughs> yeah, now it's water. I'm afraid of drowning somehow. Um, I would say I think all of us together used to be a lot more scared of, you know, fucking things up or something. Um, I think we've helped each other be okay with, you know, we're Metallica, and if we play it wrong, how, I mean, how could it be wrong if we're playing it? It's just a variation on the album. <laughs> yeah, you can think it away, um, or you can just say, hey, I felt it my best. I tried my best, then that's all I can do. If it was, you know, 30 degrees in Russia when we played that solo and, and my fingers froze up, that's as good as I could do. Or if my throat was swollen shut like that, I'm trying to sing, nothing else matters. I did my best. So I think we're a little bit better at accepting how things are, you know? The, I, I'd say the thing I'm most afraid of is probably like something like my back going out or something like that on stage where it's just like, ooh, you go down and then, <laughs> The wheelchair comes up or the stretcher and you're like, bye, <laughs> you know, I'll see ya. We'll make this one up, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't like making gigs up. And I've, I've kind of been the one who's been <laughs> making everyone else make up most of the gigs, whether it's broken arms or catching on fire or backs going out or eating bad oysters. It's <laughs> yeah, that's actually, I, I remember reading something on your website about that. It's sort of like, you seem to have that strength about you too, where, you know, you just want to keep on going, just keep that fucking freight train rolling, you know? Well, we do our best. And if, it, if we can't do a show, you know, we're human at the end of the day. And if we can't, we'll make it up. And that's the best we can do. And if people have traveled a long time, ways, you know, to come to that show that day and they can't make it the other day, it's a bummer, but it's part of life and we can't be superhuman. Um, I had a few more questions, obviously, but um, yeah, 
thank you. I really appreciate it, man. Right on. I really hope this show goes well for you guys for the next two nights and stuff. It's been awesome just being a part of everything here, like the three days that we've been doing this with Jeff and Vicky, and you know, it's 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 been great. You know, awesome experience. Awesome. I really hope it turns out good and. You know, it looks great and, and stuff because yeah. there's a lot of heart and soul in it. Especially. Right on. Thanks again. Well, we, we dig the vibe, man. We, we love having fans come from all over the place, and it's no, it's no short swim, man, for you and <laughs> others. You know, we appreciate that and the dedication that you guys have for us. And, you know, this is helping spread the word of just the good vibes, man. You know, we're out to have some fun. Absolutely. Thanks right again. On. Så vi skal prøve at holde det her i dansk. Kan vi ikke sanges? Har jeg fået at vide? Nej, nej, du må ikke læse med nu. Oh, jeg må. Oh, okay. Ja, jeg, ved du hvad, jeg synes, jeg, jeg var rimelig idé for at jeg skulle skrive dem. Men okay. øh, jeg var rimelig idé for at jeg skulle skrive dem, for jeg synes... Men det er rart at se dig hjemme i København igen, og... Du var lige... Jeg er lidt nervøs her i starten, fordi det er første gang, jeg får interviews. Eller interviewer. Men øh, Jeg springer ud i det. Ja. Okay, du er her... I er her i København for at spille fem shows. Hvordan kan det være, at I har fundet ud af, at I vil spille fem shows i Forum, i stedet for at spille et shows i Parken, for eksempel? Jamen, altså, vi prøver altid at, 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 at lave det anderledes, end det har været før. Og, og, og ligesom, øh, altså, prøve at give at lave koncertoplevelserne bliver forskellige fra hinanden. Mm. Så vi spillede i Forum i 04, og vi spillede over i Vestering i Aarhus i 07. Og øh, Roskilde et par gange her og der. Ikke? Øhm, så vi har ikke spillet indendørs i Forum siden øh, faktisk 96. Så vi er jo lidt på en, 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 en sådan indendørs europa turné som vi har kørt siden februar. Så det var ligesom, øh, indimellem skal man jo spille indendørs og spille de, de sådan, øh, mindre steder. Og øh, lave det lidt mere intimt for fansene og os selv. Så... Øh, Altså, vi vil øh, gerne her tilbage til denne bygning, og så blev billetterne reddet væk, lynhurtigt. Og så hvad med to til, og så blev de reddet væk super hurtigt. Og så tænkte vi, skal vi, lad os, så, gør vi, så prøver vi et femte og se, hvad der sker. Så det var jo det kom lidt, øh, det var lidt overraskende, at det øh, skulle gå så hurtigt. Men, øh, altså, at billetterne blev reddet væk så hurtigt, men øh, at spille fem shows, altså, det er jo super. Men altså, vi... Altså, vi, vi prøver altid at, 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 at lave oplevelserne forskellige fra hinanden, så det ikke er det samme sted hver gang, og det samme setliste og alt det der, som du ja. ved, ikke? Jeg har fundet ja. Jeg spiller en del forskellige sange her. Det gør vi, ja. Vi prøver. Hvordan... Øh, det, her, det vi filmer nu, det er jo til fankæden. Jeg er også med til at filme. Med, øh, jeg er jo til kamera, der Hvad? kører. Det er fans alle sammen, der er med til at filme. Mm. Hvordan... Øh, Hvordan kom vi på ideen til en fancamp, dengang det startede tilbage i 90? Eller, ja. Australien. Øh, Pladselskab i Australien øh, på det sorte album udgav. Øh, de puttede en t-shirt og en CD eller noget i en, i en sådan malerbøde. Jeg tror faktisk, jeg har det. Øh, kom ind! Um, og... Um, Jeg think, det er det, jeg tror, ideen kom fra, for der er australske pladser. Så så vi den der malerbøtte, den var helt genial. Så tænkte vi, jamen så øh, lavede vi nogle fankasser. Vi lavede mange, meget, mange af dem op i 90'erne. Men øh, nu, når man, nu udgiver vi jo næsten alt, hvad vi laver øh, hele tiden. Så øh, der, det er jo lidt småt med sådan specielle ting, man kan putte i. Men så kom ideen med at gøre det her, og ligesom lave noget af fansene for fansene gennem fanklubben og så videre, så virkede det cool. Men altså, den originale idé med fan øh, med, øh, med fankan, den går tilbage til, tror jeg, øh, 93 i Australien. Øh, hvor, hvor det der pladselskab kom og proppede en hel masse tid ned i sådan en malerbøde. Ja, det er der helt det udspringer fra. Ja. Jeg tror faktisk, jeg har en derhjemme, at den bøde der med sådan en guldse i det. Ah. Fordi det, den hedder ikke fankan, men jeg fandt den en... Nej, den hedder ikke fankan, ja. Nej, den er i rockhulen. Ah, ja. Men, den, ja, men den, den kom til at hedde Fankan, da vi begyndte at udgive dem selv i, i, gennem øh, fanklubben. Hvordan øh, hvor involveret er bandet og dig i, 
i selve So What og alt det merchandise der der rører på på gaden. Vi er meget involveret i det merchandise. Der er ikke noget der bliver solgt uden at vi ser det. Øh, altså vi sidder jo ikke vi er ikke så meget med i den kreative afdeling. Altså selvfølgelig når der kommer en ny plade og nogle nye, så snakker vi om idéer og så videre, men øh, altså, der er ikke noget, der bliver solgt, uden at vi ser det, øh, og vi siger nej til en, 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 en god del, øh, som ikke holder en, en eller anden standard. Jeg ved ikke helt, hvad standarden er, men altså, et eller andet, altså, hvis vi kan lide det, så sælger vi det, og hvis vi ikke kan lide det, så sælger vi det. Der er mange ting, vi siger nej til, men øh, fanklubben er vi jo meget involveret i, altså med So What, og, og altså, altså, nu har det kørt i 15 år. 16-17 år, øhm, og selvfølgelig Steffen, vores redaktør for bladet osv., altså han styrer jo foretagende, men altså vi, jeg ser hver blad, øh, inden det bliver trygt, øh, vi godkender, vi tjekker, og vi er med i, til den kreative afdelinger og, og sørger for, at tingene bliver, øh, bliver gjort ordentligt, og der er sådan en vis standard, <laughs> så I er en del involveret, så det er ikke bare sådan nogen, der står og skriver en hel masse interviews omkring, og så rører det ud? Det var også ideen, altså mange fanklubs var jo, øh, fanklubs var jo decideret øh, øh, noget, som var sat op gennem sådan nogle, øh, sådan nogle post, øh, øh, det, var engang, det, var, det var sådan nogle øh, agenturer eller sådan nogle selskaber, der lavede sådan noget post, øh, mail order, merchandise for bands og så videre, altså det var jo det rent fubbersvindel. Og øh, så vi, da vi lancerede fanklubben i 93, altså begyndte vi jo at, øh, altså begyndte vi jo at, 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 ligesom, at ville være involveret i det. Øh, og, 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 og ligesom prøve at, at være, være, være involveret øh, i så mange af detaljerne som muligt. Godt at høre, at I er involveret, er der ikke bare nogen, der styrer jer? Nej, 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 selvfølgelig. Men det er også, øh, øh, det foregår nede på HQ, øh, ja. der øh, hvor vi er. Og vi holder til, så øhm, altså, vi går ind og, og tjekker, øh, altså alle tingene bliver til der. Så det er også øh, rent praktisk, er vi faktisk øh, også, altså det, det foregår i den samme bygning. Nu ved jeg, når I øh, inden I går på scenen, så går I jo ind i jeres tuning room og lige øver jer lidt og varmer op. Hvordan, øh, hvordan bygger I en setliste op, inden I går på scenen? For det, det ved jeg, at det foregår sådan forholdsvis kort tid, inden I går på scenen? Jamen, altså, jeg sidder ned og, øh, og prøver bare at, 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 at sætte øh, nogle numre sammen, som vi ikke har spillet. Det er dig, der laver setlisten? Det er mig, der laver setlisten, ja. Jeg sidder og prøver at, og, øh, altså, at sætte nogle øh, forskellige numre sammen hver aften, og prøver sådan lidt gammelt og lidt nyt, og lidt af det ene og lidt af det andet, og så nogle numre, som vi har spillet øh, ofte, og så nogle numre, som vi ikke spiller så ofte, nogle specielle ting osv. Og... Øh, så sker der sådan en organisk hen ad vejen. Øh, normalt, når vi spiller øh, en eller to koncerter i byer, så sidder jeg meget og, og kigger på setlister fra de byer, vi har spillet i før. Øh, for de byer, for de byer nu, vi spillede før, så for eksempel, øh, hvis vi spiller i øh, Sydney, så når vi, gang, vi spiller i Sydney, så vil jeg sidde og kigge på setlisterne fra de sidste par gange, vi har spillet i Sydney, og sørge for, at vi ikke spiller nøjagtigt de samme numre i den træk, samme rækkefølge osv. Så, så jeg sidder ofte med setlisterne. Jeg får sådan et, et printout af, øh, af setlisterne fra de sidste 10 år i den by, og, sådan, og sørge for, at, ikke, at vi spiller de samme setlister igen. Lidt nyt. Ja. Lidt nyt og frisk. Ja. Hvilken sang nu er I simpelthen en rimelig stort bagkatalog? Hvordan er der en speciel sang, som du, du er allermest stolt af at være med? Være med til at skrive. Eller ikke være, ikke være med til, men hvilken sang er du faktisk mest stolt af at have skrevet? Altså, jeg ved sgu ikke, om jeg kan, jeg ved sgu ikke, om jeg kan øh, bare hive en ud. Altså, øh, selvfølgelig, øh, altså, selvfølgelig, øh, altså, de samme som altså, altså, du kan gætte dig til, altså Master Puppets, One, selvfølgelig uh, Enter Sandman. Uh, de, store, de store klasser, klassikere. Ja, altså, jeg kan sgu ikke, jeg ved ikke om, uh, altså der er også en grund til, det de er blevet klassikerne i forhold til uh, Carpe Diem Baby eller et eller andet, altså. Uh, Så altså, ikke altså, altså de, de er jo betydnings, altså One og, og, og så de der numre, altså. Det er jo ligesom dem, der har betydet noget, eller været banebrydende, eller hvad fanden man siger. 
Men altså, jeg er jo stolt over dem alle sammen, men altså dem, der, du siger, hvad for et, altså, så er det selvfølgelig mere over i den afdeling. Der er, ikke, der er ikke et bestemt nummer, der virkelig giver dig kuldegysning, og du tænker, at den er simpelthen bare for fed. Den er, det er simpelthen... Nej, det er der sgu ikke. Uh, altså, jeg har jo mange forskellige forhold til, til numrene. Jeg, har, uh, jeg tror i hvert fald, jeg har tre forhold til numrene. Jeg har et nummer... Uh, jeg har forholdet, når... Uh, forholdet til numrene, da de blev kreeret, da de blev komponeret, da de kom til, da de blev indspillet. Det er et forhold. Og det er meget øh, også med, øh, med hukommelse og memories og gang i den. Ikke? Så er der det forhold, jeg har til øh, numrene, når jeg hører dem. Meget kritisk. Sidder og tænker på, hvad jeg sidder selv og laver. Sidder og tænker på, hvor det kunne have været bedre. Hvad fanden tænkte vi der? Hvorfor gjorde vi ikke det dobbelt så lang tid? Det er det andet forhold. Så er der det tredje forhold, det er at spille dem. Det er også det er noget helt andet noget, og så sidde der, og så, hvad kommer der nu, hvad sker der så, og hvorfor er den der pære køjen det om, og ham dernede, hvorfor har han den der trøje på, i stedet for en anden trøje. Så der, der er også en, en anden dynamik øh, til stede der. Så det er mange forskellige forhold at have med de der numre, ikke? og de er også altid ofte, ofte anderledes, og har forskellige øh, forhold. Så er der nogle numre, der er spændende at spille et stykke tid, og så næste år de røg kedelige. Og så videre, så videre, så videre. Så det er altså, jeg er ikke den, jeg er ikke den der kan skatte ud i pap og sidde og sige sådan, det er nummer, det er det bedste, og resten af dem, det har jeg ikke det samme forhold til. Det, altså sådan har jeg det ikke med vores musik. Okay. Apropos talte om, nogle gange bliver det kedelige. Bliver du nogensinde træt af at spille de samme sange? Ja, selvfølgelig. Men altså, øh, jeg bliver, jeg bliver mere træt af at tænke på at spille de samme sange, end jeg faktisk er, når jeg spiller dem, fordi... Altså, okay, igen, så er der to, to forhold igen, så er der i øveren, hvor det kan hænge der langt ud af halsen. Men op på scenen, når der står foran 10, 20, 30, 50.000 mennesker, altså så... Øh, så er der altid gang i den. Og så de ting, som nogle gange i øverne, altså spille ind til Sandman i øverne, altså det kommer vi næsten aldrig igennem, fordi vi kan spille det øh, sovende, stående på hovedet, øh, med bind for øjnene og den <laughs> hele, øh, Så altså, øh, men at spille det live er jo super, så det er jo noget, altså, det, er, det er også to forskellige, øh, to forskellige ting. Har du et, øh, et bedste fanøjeblik, kan man sige? Er der et, der bare stikker ud fra hele din karriere, hvor du bare tænker, det der, den gave, jeg fik der, eller et eller andet? Der, jeg kan bare ikke lade være med at glemme den person, var så venlig at snakke med, eller et eller andet. Der er sgu så mange, altså. Der er nogle af de trofaste fans, som er så med. Altså ham Ron for eksempel, som er med, og ham Blue og så videre. Altså nogle af de der drenge, der rejser og kræfter med med over hele jorden. Altså det er utroligt, at de gør det. Det er jo super spændende, fornemt. Øhm, og så er der jo de der fanøjeblikke øhm, Altså øh, Jeg kan jo den første gang øh, Jeg skal jo, skal jo passe på her Metallica Fanklub Man er jo sådan en familie Men altså den første gang øh, Altså når folk De gjorde det i 80'erne et par gange i USA Det tog virkelig røgn på mig Når de var over i den der afdeling med øh, Om ikke godt øh, Du vil øh, sådan bold med konen eller, øh, eller det en, altså over i den retning der øhm, det vil betyde meget for mig hvis du vil nu siger det pænt hvis du vil sove med min øh, eller være sammen med min øh, være sammen med min pige og sådan. Det, det skete sådan tre eller fire gange over nogle år det var meget underligt øh, der står sådan en fyr sådan helt sådan glad kan vi kan ikke vil du ikke øh, bare gøre det ja øh, tag dig min pige okay. øh, Okay, og hvad rolle spiller du i det? <laughs> Meget underligt. Strange. Øh, men, øh, men altså generelt nu om dagen er det jo meget stille og roligt. Øh, nogle autografer og lidt billeder og så videre. Så det er faldet ned på et rimelig normalt niveau? Det er bestemt. Perfekt. Hvorfor... Man har aldrig rigtig hørt om nogen fra bandet, der har lavet sideprojekter. Nej. Er der specielt grund til det? 
Eller har I synes, at bare for travlt med det, I laver? Vi har jo alle sammen hørt om... Ja, altså, det er også fordi, vi er så stolte af, hvad Metallica er, hvad Metallica repræsenterer. Det er jo ikke noget, altså, det er jo ikke noget, vi har, det er jo ikke noget, vi har brug for. Jeg har i hvert fald ikke brug for det. Jeg er ikke interesseret i at spille musik med andre end Metallica. Det er ikke noget, der siger mig noget. James har jo gået og pillet det. Altså, når Merciful Fate-drengene ringer og spørger, om jeg vil komme og slå på trommen på et af deres numre, så, så er det jo også... Øhm, så er det jo også... Øh, så er det mere sådan nogle små gæsteoptrædende? Ja. Øh, så altså, øh, altså, det er ikke noget, jeg har et specielt interesse i. Jeg ved ikke, om nogen af de andre er det, men det er ikke noget. Altså, jeg, jeg har ikke nogen øh, musikalske øh, aspirationer ud over Metallica. De tre sidste ture, jeg ja, sommerture, Sick of the Studio og Escape from the Studio, jeg kan ikke huske, hvad den, hvad den sidste var, men hvorfor? De har jo altid været i Europa, og der er sikkert masser af fans, der tænker, hvorfor bliver jeg ved med at komme tilbage sommer efter sommer, spille alle ja, festivalerne? Jo, ja, men der er jo ikke, der er jo ikke sådan en specielt decideret festival øh, i USA, altså festivaltur i USA. Der, der er begyndt at komme det de sidste par år, men altså, vi, øh, vi er jo, der er meget kærlighed i Europa. Så vi har øh, altså vi, vi taget godt rundt, og, og der er mange festivaler forskellige steder at spille. Det er også det, vi godt kan lide at tage på sommerferie i Europa. Øh, det er jo ikke noget mod de amerikanske fans eller nogle andre fans, men øh, jeg skal jo hjem til Danmark hver sommer med børn. Så når jeg til hjem til Danmark, kan jeg blive så godt spille her. <laughs> det er jeg med på. <laughs> Hvordan, jeg hørte dengang, I spillede... Da I indspillede uh, Death Magnetic, der havde I to-tre ekstra sange som I indspillede, men som der ikke kom med på pladen. Hvad, hvad sker der med dem? Jamen altså, der ligger også nogle øh, etter og nåler et eller andet sted i en hard drive. Og, 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 øh, øh, altså på et eller andet tidspunkt sker der nok noget med dem. Eller også bliver de kølet ud, eller også ligger de bare i den der bankboks forever. Men det, det, er ikke, det, er ikke noget, altså, det er ikke noget, jeg har et svar på lige nu. Det er ikke noget, det er ikke noget der er sådan op over byen eller imminent eller noget. Øhm, altså, øh, det er noget, vi kan vende tilbage til på et eller andet tidspunkt. Lige nu er jeg må prøve at overleve den her turné øh, og køre det over til. Men øh, altså, de der numre, altså, der, på et eller andet tidspunkt sker der nok noget med dem i en eller anden, på en eller anden, en eller anden form. Det går meget godt med at overleve turnéen indtil videre i hvert fald. Ja, jeg går aldrig. Um, Ecstasy of Gold, jeres intronummer. Ja. Det er det, I bruger som intronummer i hvert fald. Hvordan kom I på at bruge det, og hvor lang tid har I Johnny brugt det? C, øh, det er vores gamle manager, Johnny C, der kom med den idé, da vi kom ud til øh, Østkysten i øh, 83. Det var egentlig det første idé, han havde. Det var, øh, at han syntes, vi skulle bruge det til at gå på scenen. Så gjorde vi det. Så det var cool nok. Øh, så det er 26 år siden. Og det har der faktisk været jeres husintro, kan man ja, sige. Ja, mere eller mindre hele vejen igen, ja. Hvordan kan det være, at I har brugt en, en centerscene på den her turné? Nu har I har brugt på det sorte album, det black album og ja, når vi spiller Når vi spiller indendørs, spiller vi jo i, inde i midten. Det er jo fordi, der den der variation kommer fra at spille uh, udendørs, når vi spiller i stadion og one end. Så det, 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 det der, der, hvor vi begyndte heroppe i det første spørgsmål, øh, det var det der, det, det der med at, øh, at lave oplevelsen så forskellig og så anderledes som muligt øh, fra sidste gang. Så det, 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 og så også selvfølgelig, når vi spiller inde i midten, og, og det der, øh, så er det sådan noget... Øh, are you moving with me? Jo. Uh, guys look very serious. <laughs> It's pretty intense. Yeah. Okay. I was Danish. Yeah. <laughs> The excitement was intense. Um, så det er um, ligesom det der med at give en, en forskellig, en anderledes oplevelse hver gang. Og, um, og det er også sp- at spille ind i midten, altså det er jo super fedt, så kommer du tættere på folk, så er det mere intimt. Mm. Nu har du jo faktisk næsten alt, når man tænker på generelt. Du har opnået så meget i dit liv. Har du noget nyt på banen, du har tænkt dig? Jeg tænker mig at investere en god del af, af min fremtid i at sove. Det er så, godt, øh... godt valg. <laughs> det vil jeg glæde mig til, i hvert fald efter at have været i København i tre uger. Så det er ikke meget, man får sovet i Danmark, du, der har kraftet mig hammer på hele tiden. Du har været svært for fat i, fordi at, øh, det her interview det skulle faktisk have sket i onsdag til sidste ja, uge. Ja, der sker noget hele tiden. Altså, der er jo hele tiden noget, jeg skal lave i Danmark. 
det er ikke det mest afslappende sted at være. Det er dejligt. Der er ikke noget sted, jeg vil være om sommeren i Danmark, men øh, ideen om at, at sætte sig ned og sove et par dage, det, det lyder genialt. Vi er faktisk nået til det sidste spørgsmål. Okay. Jeg tror ikke, det skulle ske, men øh, vi skal jo spørge. Hvor mange, hvor mange gæster tror du, du har på din gæsteliste? Så sådan en, øh, de her fem koncerter? Ah, der er omkring 100 hver aften. Så øh, omkring 500 cirka. Det er, en, det, øh, det er en... Det er, hvad er det? Ja, så er det en 10.000 nej, skal vi se. Jeg vil slet ikke rumme ud det der. Kan, det kan vi rulle hernede lige nu. Så kan der stå hernede, øh, hvor, mange, hvor stor en procentdel af Danmarks befolkning det er. Okay. Dernede står det nu. Super! Vi nåede det. Vi kom til vejs ende. Jeg står, hvor jeg får helt sved i hænder. Hold den her mikrofon. Thank you. Thank you. Lars, Hey Kirk, I'm Dennis. I'm a fan from uh, Metallica for the last 15, 20 years. Yeah, you, you recognize me from somewhere. We, tell, we talk about that later. So um, they asked me to do some questions for the fan can. Um, I'm gonna. I just wrote. I had just written down some some questions, so uh, I just take them in random order. Um, first question is, uh, what happens with the T-shirts you get you get from fans during the meet and greet, and the CDs and the, the candies or something? It all goes into a, a, a big uh, a box. That's uh, once that box is filled up, it's sent home, and at the end of the tour, I go kind of go through it all, and um, it gives me a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, 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 pleasure just going through all that stuff and, and seeing all the stuff, all the cool stuff I, that uh, people ha have given me and given us. And you know, I go through all the CDs and listen to them a lot. A lot of uh, a lot of them are, are 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 time sensitive, meaning listen to this by Wednesday, but by the time I get around to it, it's like six months later. And so, you know, if there's any opportunities there, I've I've pretty much missed it. But um, Yeah, all this stuff just pre or pretty much goes into a big box and is shipped home until I can get to it after the tour. Yeah, but we know the banners, you hang them up in the, uh, in the Q, I think, HQ. Yeah. Um, but what, uh, what, what with the t-shirts you get, if they're really your size, you really wear them, or you just keep them as a, as a souvenir? I keep them more as a souvenir. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, stuff like that, I, I tend to, to just kind of uh, uh, put away, and one day I'm just going to display them all. That's fair enough. So um, one question on my list is, um, well, we, we tape, sometimes we tape during the show, we, we tape you on, on stage, but why is it so hard to tape Kirk? Because for some reason, Kirk always seems to run away from the camera. Uh, I'm just, I, you know, I'm hyper when I'm on stage, you know, I, uh, it's hard for me to stay in one spot. And uh, that's been a, a complaint with uh, photographers as well, is that, It's just hard to take, uh, uh, take pictures of because uh, by the time they've gotten um, uh, gotten me in, in focused, I've t I've moved on. It's just hard for me to stand in one spot. I mean, I just I'm restless on stage. I have a, I'm, I'm hyped up, you know. I'm excited. I'm feeling the energy of the music and the energy coming off the audience. Well, that's fair enough. Um, so um, what have I have more? Um, well. Because you're on stage now, let's talk about the beach ball moment. Um, after 50 times, after 50 shows, is it still fun to kick on the balls? Absolutely, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I mean, I have to say, it's it's very cool, and it it looks totally surreal when they start dropping around, dropping down, and, and people are punching them and and, and hitting them all around. Uh, it's weird because like certain countries uh, will just take them and grab them. Other countries will just like just uh, uh, kick them all around and and, uh, and uh, kind of uh, play volleyball back and forth with them. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, times the fans will just throw them back on stage, which is weird to me because I would think you know they would would want to keep it. But I mean, yeah, it's fun. It's, and who who came up with the idea for the beach balls? Uh, it, it was actually a joke I made to uh, Tony DeChacho, um Uh, one of the guys at Q Prime, I said, yeah, and at the end of the show, we can have, 
these balloons coming down. Well, sure enough, at the O2 in uh, England, at the end of the show, all these balloons came down, and I just started cracking up. We all just started cracking up. What's your favorite music? My favorite, I, it's hard for me to pin down a, a, a favorite type of music because I listen to all sorts of stuff. I mean, if you're to like look on my iTunes shuffle sort of thing, you'd have like rock, metal, jazz, blues, funk, R&B and soul, classical, you know, country music. I listen to everything. And uh, I just, I'm just all pretty much all over the map. I like anything that I think is quality music, you know, that moves me emotionally. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I like, you know, but I mean, to give you more uh, concrete examples, I love the new, sis or new uh, Lamb of God album. I love the, the new Mastodon album. Um, I love the new Mars Volta album. Uh, I like a band uh, called Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings, which is like modern R&B and soul, um, I, you know, I love a lot of like, you know, jazz stuff, older jazz stuff. So I'm, I'm pretty much just all over the place. I like an, uh, this French band called Gojira. I think they're really great. Um, you can tell the metal bands that I like because they always end up on tour with us. Okay, and then uh, going over to the to the meet and greets, um, you notice if you go if you go to the meet and greet, there's a lot of fans nervous. Are you still nervous for doing a meet and greet, or is it just in a relaxed mood? I'm always in a relaxed mood, you know, and I I realize that the more relaxed I am, the more relaxed they tend to be too. And uh, a lot of times, I say to them, you know, they say to me, "God, I'm so nervous." I, I say, "It's okay, it's only me." But then I realize that that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now about surfing. What is your favorite spot on this planet? To surf. Uh, you know, that's a hard one. That's like asking me what my favorite Metallica song is. I mean, because every surf spot is different. You know, every surf spot has a, 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 a unique wave. You know, rather than having a, a, a favorite spot, I just like to like you know, go out there and surf and have as much fun as I possibly can. There's an old uh, surfer saying that goes, the best surfer is the guy who is having the, the most fun. And so Doesn't that's, yeah, th so that's what I try to do. I try, you know, whenever I go out to surf, whether it's California, Portugal, you know, uh, Malibu, Hawaii, uh, Japan, Australia, I just try to have the most fun. All right, and then uh, maybe uh, talking about some guitars, um, do you take your guitars with you at home? I mean, to your house, or are they still at the HQ? Or how are you doing when you're going on tour? You take your guitar uh, to your hotel room, or how you do that? I pretty much always have a guitar with me, all the time. I have tons of guitars at HQ, obviously. I have a few of them at my house. I, when I'm traveling on tour, I always have a guitar that I could play in the hotel room. Um, sometimes I wish I had two, because last night I was with Brent, from Mastodon, and we, we both wanted to play guitar, but there was only one guitar, so we're like just giving each other back and forth. We're, oh, check this out. Oh, let's check this out. Oh, listen to this. Check this out. For like about an hour and a half, we were doing that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, do you know how much guitars you have? I refuse to count. <laughs> you refuse, but you know approximately? A lot. A lot. All right. Okay. Nice All right. Thank you very much. Cheers. The other night, it, it felt really good to see hardcore fans filming us because, for one thing, it really makes you, uh, how do you say, feel energized and really want to show the fan that you're, that's filming you, you know, how fired up you are to be performing this particular Metallica song for them and to have them right there documenting it. And it, it, it's more like, it's, it's a little more heartfelt, I think, than just some guy who doesn't know the band, you know kind of doing his job, I think you can feel the energy from the person filming. That's the way I felt the other night. Um, it, uh, it, it's exciting for us, for sure, you know. I think it actually makes us work a little harder and play a little more intensely. Not, not to say that we don't, but it's like 
you get so far into a tour, we're over a year of, of touring, it's inspiring to, uh, to have that and have that kind of energy in front of us. And I'm sure it's going to be probably some of the best live footage that Metallica's seen in a long time just because of what the fans are going to put into it. And I'm excited. I, I think we did some, some, uh, some good work with you, know, you guys the other night, and I'm sure these next few nights are going to be just as great. When you were playing with, with Ozzy, mm -hmm. um, you didn't have, to, uh, didn't have to do so much press and interview stuff. Well, how, right. how do you deal with that right now? How, do, how, does, it, how does it feel? Getting into the Metallica situation, it's like going to the opposite end of the spectrum where you have a lot of responsibility. And, um, you know, obviously you've got probably more press than almost any other band. One of the things about Metallica is we always try to really cater to, the, to our fans and cater to, you know, the mags and, and do just really throw it out there and let people know that we care. And um, that's why we have one of the best fan clubs in the world, if not the best fan club in the world, because the band cares. So it's a lot of work, but it's actually, uh, it, it feels good and very rewarding. Okay. Uh, I saw you also today on the stage before, uh, before the audience came in. Um, you were jamming about half an hour or something like that, checking out settings or, or whatever. Um, do you find hard to, or do you have to put a lot of you in, into into what you are doing to stay to stay in, in sync with with other guys or, or with, with with the thing that you're doing? Well, basically, this is a rare occasion. Um, you know, we're here in Copenhagen. We've got five shows in the same venue, so it's very rare that you have the opportunity to have a, your equipment set up for this many days. And to be honest, with some of the bases we've been having some problems with uh, getting the sound so today was a, a great opportunity to actually get with Big Mick our sound man and find out what can make those bases better you know bringing up the mids reducing the lows just trying to to make these adjustments so that these bases will sound better for the show you know um, when you're playing over two hours of music and you're in at least for me I, I'm rotating about 15 different instruments into the set it's you know we play sometimes over 18 songs and uh, some of the instruments don't hold up as well as others so today was a perfect opportunity to make some adjustments and hopefully we'll be doing it the next couple of days but it's very rare that we're in one location this many days so this is a great time to to fine tune so to speak but this isn't something that i regularly do usually it's just like you know you roll in a couple of hours before get your press going and everything but this is this was good today and uh, I, th i thought we got good results and uh, hopefully tomorrow we'll get the same okay are there any other pluses or minuses of being five days in, in the same place I, you know I think it's all good. I mean, one of the great things, one of the pluses, obviously, is that this is uh, Lars's uh, stomping ground, his his home turf, so to speak, and um, that in itself makes it special. It's a special occasion for him. It's a special occasion for Metallica, because as as everybody knows, um, a lot of what Metallica is about has come from from Denmark and come from. I mean, not just Denmark, but Scandinavia and um, a lot of the influences uh, that surround the band sort of originated on this turf and in Lars's brain and his mind. And one of the things I, I, I feel is that it's always special when you play places where there's the history, you know, uh, whether it's the band having recorded here and spent a lot of time here, members being born here or even like in Los Angeles, for me, it's obviously interesting and special because it's where I'm from, and it's also special for Metallica because, you know, it's where, you know, James and Lars met and Dave Mustaine and helped create the early stages of Metallica, you know, whether it's Kill 'em All or Ride the Lightning, and then obviously, and then there's the transition where suddenly they're in the Bay Area and they're getting together with Cliff and, and um, 
of course, Kirk. So to me, Copenhagen in Denmark is an important phase of this journey, which has, you know, other cities in the mix too. Okay. And, uh, and that's very special. So it's an honor and a privilege to be playing on uh, the, the soil of Copenhagen. And the fans have been great. Okay. Um, you are also altering the set list um, each night. Uh, are we going to hear something special during these five shows? Because, you know, five shows in, in one place, that's that's a lot how how much or how much new stuff or or unexpected stuff is going to be there as you know as everyone knows Lars really instigates what we're going to play and initiates at least the idea of what we should do and i had some ideas for these five shows that i shared with the band and um, i feel fortunate that it has been addressed and we're going to be actually attempting some of that you know, sometimes you can't always get what you wish for, but you know you can get some of it. I'm still trying to get the guys to play Freight Ends of Sanity, so okay. <laughs> that might take a while, and I don't think you'll hear it here. But okay, uh, how do you feel technically? Well, when let's say Lars says, "Okay, let's throw Phantom Lord in tonight." Oh, I feel good. I feel good now. Um, five years ago, four years ago, whatever, I would have been like, "Oh." shit you know when I when I first joined the band it was so overwhelming because I had to learn all the songs off Saint Anger and this is material that the band had never played as a band because it was recorded like straight onto you know to, to tape um, so it was a challenge for me to learn that material and then on top of that to learn this back catalog that ranged well over 20 years and at the time, they hadn't really been really messing around a lot with stuff from Kill 'Em All so much. It was always edited. And then all of a sudden, we go into our first batch of shows at the Fillmore, and it's like, let's play Phantom Lord tonight, you know? It, it, it's like, Phantom Lord, oh, shit. Because they give me a list, and it wasn't on the list. And I said, here's an A list, here's a B list, here's a C list. And I started getting songs from, you know, you ask one guy, he says, oh, we're not going to play that. No, we're not going to play that. We're not going to play that. And all of a sudden you ask another guy and he's like going, ah, you know, we might play that. And then, you know, it's just somebody had a different view of what the set was going to always be. And it was never on the same page. So I ended up kind of getting myself in a situation where I was playing a lot of obscure material, um, stuff that I didn't expect to play. So. In a way, there's something special about that to me because, to, to be honest, those Fillmore shows were like truly rehearsals. As people may or may not know, when Metallica gets really busy, the rehearsals become a little less than, uh, than probably most bands would expect because, again, because of the press load and the photo sessions and everything that goes into the mix. And then you've got your families too, so you try to kind of take care of everything. And sometimes the rehearsals get cut a little more than they should. Um, now that we've been a band for a long time and we've played, you know, everything from the Master of Puppets album in its entirety, and you know, most to Kill 'Em All and Ride the Lightning, we're we're in a lot better shape than we were. So I'm not intimidated by any of the material anymore. Thank God. I mean, I've got the guys playing Dyer's Eve now on a regular rotation. Um, we're playing songs like My Apocalypse, and uh, it, it's really a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully we get, again, some more of the inactive material in there, too. You know, I'm, I love songs like Orion and Call of Cthulhu and stuff like this. So we'll see. Okay, uh, how did you exactly technically learn these songs? Do you, do you went through tabs or, or do you listen to CDs or...? Everything. I. When I first joined the band, I had the books. I mean, literally. It's funny because not only did I have the books, like I remember Kirk having the books and, and James, you know, James even. Some of the songs that hadn't been played in such a long time, you know, it's like, wait, how? What note was that? Was that, you know, a, a flat or a, you know, or a, a or whatever, you know? So actually, the notes that your books offer you, you know your answers sometimes. So I kind of had everything in the mix. Um, even like sometimes for live arrangements, you've got to refer back to what the band did in, you know, in 1986 or whatever. 
So sometimes it's good to reference old material. I'm the one guy in the band where I have a CD of everything. I've got CDs from you know, every show that we've done as a band almost, or at least the ones that sounded good. Um, that way I, I'm always kind of up, you know, up to date with what we're going to do. Because some songs are edited. Like if we play a song like Trapped Under Ice, you know, maybe a good chunk of the time we played it full arrangement. And then now we're playing a slightly edited arrangement. So it's always good to have an updated version of, of like a song like Trapped Under Ice or whatever. And, and so I'm the type of person that has a lot of information with me when I'm trying to learn something. And that way it makes less time with, with James or something. Like I don't have to ask, you know, show me this song. It's just like, show me this note, you know, or whatever. I end up showing him the note now, you know. So uh, it's, again, it's, it's all balancing out well now. And uh, we're, you know, we're doing a lot better than we were. So it's, uh, at the moment, it's, it's really cool with all the families and everything. At the moment, everybody's vibing really well. We've got some fun stuff planned, uh, um, not related to the music, but more like related to the families. Um, yesterday was my son's birthday and the Hetfield family came out. We went to Tivoli, some of the crew was there. We had a really great lunch and went on all the rides and had a really great time together. Did your son get pied as well? Did he what? Did he get pied? Thank God he didn't get pied. <laughs> But it, it's funny because one of the guys in the crew got pied the other night. And I saw all the crew with these, you know, with these pies. And I go, no, they're not going to pie my son. He's four years old. Man. And uh, yeah, so someone else ended up getting it. But um, maybe next year. <laughs> When the tour is over, what's next? Well, we, we're already working on ideas. Um, for new material. Uh, we have our tuning room, so there's always some sort of jamming going on. Um, I always say that Hetfield is a, a riff machine. Comes with ideas, like he turns a knob and there's a great idea. So there's no shortage of, of, of new song ideas. Um, I think everybody will be working towards their, uh, kind of their creative side and developing, you know, parts for songs and uh, and also enjoying the time off. I have to say thank you for the opportunity to be here and to uh, to be a, a part for the filming crew. Great. So that's that's a lifetime opportunity for all of us. Yeah. We really appreciate our fans. We appreciate our fan club and how hard you guys work in supporting us because we feed off that. And there's a demand that's been created for Metallica still after all these years and all these different phases of the band's existence. So we feel honored and privileged that we've got a fan base that really cares about us and we can keep making music and be motivated to make music, you know? It, it's like, it's gotten, in the last year or two, it just seemed to have exploded on all fronts with even new, new members, young members, older members discovering the band. So a lot of good has happened for us and uh, we feel very fortunate and uh, we're excited to continue this journey and I, you know, me personally I feel like Death Magnetic is the launch pad into even more, you know, and, and it's like only the first step into more things that we can do musically and also for the stage. So there's a lot of good things coming up for the future. So we'll be with you for another few years. <laughs>